welcome and welcome to the people watching on camera <laughs> now or at midnight in your bed just wanting some extra help going to sleep. So I'm Matt Landman, I'm one of the uh, pediatric surgeons at Riley Hospital. Um, I've been there for about seven years now. I'm also trauma medical director for our um, trauma program. So happy to talk about pediatric trauma. Honestly, a lot of the stuff you guys will probably know, it's, it's, it's a review, it may seem pretty simple, but honestly with kids, I think simple, make it easy, stick to the basics is probably the best strategy. But that being said, please just ask questions. We can stop the talk halfway through and talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, and go from there. I sadly have no financial disclosures, but if you're looking to come up with some, let me know. We can make some financial conflicts of interest. So we're going to talk about the epidemiology of trauma in kids, some trauma mechanisms. We'll talk um, specifically about physical child abuse, which I think is a unique aspect of pediatric trauma, and per particularly you all as the front line um, for medical care in these cases can really impact um, how we understand a patient's living condition, the circumstances around an injury, um, and uh, try to contextualize a lot of the injuries that patients have had. And then specifically talk about the pre-hospital uh, pediatric trauma care. And then we'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. I'm happy to do that. As a little background, I grew up in Iowa, in this, actually the town I grew up in doesn't have a dot, um, but it's in this area, and um, I was on the local EMS crew, and um, I was uh, I was an EMTB, I think that's a, there's a crossover to Indiana for that, which is essentially learning kind of which end of the stretcher goes in first and going really fast um, to get to the hospital was terrified and then when you add like pediatrics on top of that was a terrifying experience for me and um, my hope today is that we can try to alleviate some of the terror for pediatric traumas I looked up the 10 scariest things in the world and these are apparently what they are according to this article and um, some of these I don't remember where they're at or what they are but I think when it comes to EMS, what I've heard from providers is uh, number one through ten of the scariest things would be a sick pediatric patient, maybe an OB patient I would put on the list as they were talking about back in the back of the room, and then it's like everything else. So the hope today is that we can talk a little bit about um, making that a little bit easier for you. By way of just an introduction in terms of um, epidemiology, um, there are lots of deaths every year if you think about you know, 12,000 kids dying annually from one type of um, general mechan general issue, this being trauma, that's a pretty significant number. Uh, as with um, adult trauma, pediatric trauma may also have a higher injury death rate. And then you look at the mechanisms there, and I'll talk a little bit about the mechanisms we see at Riley. Um, and just over 9 million kids treated annually for accidents. And we know this goes much deeper, and you may even see this on your runs, where if there's, for every kid that dies, there's 25 that go to the hospital and get admitted, there's almost 1,000 that are in the emergency department, and even more that are um, treated in physicians' offices uh, annually. And so this is a big issue. Um, it, it bears a lot in terms of mortality, um, in terms of an issue in this, in this country, uh, but also significant morbidities. This is uh, data from 2019 from the CDC, and if you look at causes of death in the pediatric and young adult populations, unintentional injury is the number one, uh, except for our very uh, smallest patients in which congenital anomalies predominate. You guys have probably seen this before. It ends up in a lot of textbooks. It's this trimodal distribution of mortality. So when trauma patients die, you know, when do they die? And there's this, um, Don Trunke came up with this in the 1980s, essentially three uh, areas of, of mortality. There's the immediate mortality, uh, or right around the time of injury. There's the mortality early after injury, and then there's the downstream mortality, which ends up being sort of sepsis and those sorts of things. Um, each one of these areas has a kind of intervention. Uh, you know, we think about those immediate injuries, the ones that when you guys get to the scene, there's really nothing you can do. I mean, that, those are prevention uh, type things that we need to work on, wearing seat belts, helmets, all those sorts of things. 
Uh, the late downstream ones are, are really uh, hospital based, uh, but those that middle uh, hump there, if you will, in the distribution is really where um, you guys can affect the most um, change and the most benefit to patients. And that's exsanguination, that's rapid transport of head injured patients, keeping them warm, keeping them oxygenated, uh, decompressing tension pneumothoraces, those sorts of things that are gonna keep our patients alive. So we'll talk a little bit about mechanism in pediatric trauma. This is trauma from Riley for the last uh, three years uh, and looking at mortality or, or any mechanisms and then on the right is mortality. So falls are by far our most common falls in MVCs and then it's sort of everything else after that. Uh, but I think the most interesting part of this um, graph is really to look at where um, trauma patients at Riley Hospital, what mechanisms are bring death. And it's sort of um, three categories for, uh, the highest one is actually co-sleeping. So, and you guys have probably been on those runs where a mom wakes up at early morning hours, kids in bed with them, babies in bed with them, and babies unresponsive. And um, we see a lot of that. Those patients tend generally are kind of dead on scene, you know, due to our local kind of environment in terms of regulations, you're still gonna provide some resuscitation and those patients are, are called pretty quick once they get to the hospital. Uh, the next set is sadly non-accidental trauma. And so we see uh, trauma, non-accidental trauma, child abuse is rampant in this state and everywhere, sadly. Um, and so a lot of those patients end up dying. And then um, gunshot wounds. So I don't know, I'm sure you guys have experienced uh, the uptick in, in viol interpersonal violence, um, kind of three mechanisms. You know, obviously suicide is something we see in our, in our ad adolescent population, sadly. We also see um, unsafe storage and then interpersonal violence. And then 10% uh, of our mortalities are MVCs. Um, it, it, it's probably fairly obvious that the most seriously injured kids have multiple different types of injuries. However, central nervous system brain injuries are really what imp impact mortality and morbidity long term for our patients. Um, while spinal injuries are rare, if you think about the number of years lost from death or the number of years impacted for an injury like a spinal cord injury, it's a significant amount of, of time. Thoracic injuries are rare, but can cause significant mortality. Um, pediatric patients, and we'll talk a little bit about this, have significant vulnerability of their intra-abdominal organs, and then insensible fluid and heat loss, as you guys probably know. Kids have big heads, we all know that. Their skull is, uh, and scalp is thin, so they're a higher risk for traumatic brain injuries. Um, can you see this pointer? Yeah, you can kind of see it. Not so much. Um, you know, they go from alien heads to kind of normal heads over time, um, but that impacts, you know, when you have a fall, what hits first, uh, and how significant it is can be um, a relatively insignificant um, mechanism, particularly for our smallest patients. As I mentioned, it's the most common isolated system injured and it's the leading cause of death for our patients. And it determines how they do. Uh, if you look at particularly spine fractures, um, uh, and mortality, it's you know, almost half those kids can have mortality, and that's really due to the high cervical spine injuries and respiratory type of rest. Uh, initially, and then downstream, you run into those things like significant pulmonary mortality or morbidities, long-term vent problems, and then um, death. And spine fractures in adults, it's a little bit lower. Why is that? Well, when you talk about a, a spine fracture in kids, it takes a, you can take a significant amount of injury energy and transfer that to the spine. If you do axial loading uh, down on the spine, um, you can see a significant burst type uh, injury. Uh, you can also have extreme flexion and extension. That with a giant head, weak muscles, lax ligaments, results in fractures. Uh, in kids, in, in the youngest of our kids, that ends up being a high cervical spine injury, and as they get older, that tends to be a little bit lower. Um, and importantly, you can have significant cervical spine injuries without any sort of um, bony fracture. They can have just ligamentous injury. Uh, when you're talking about um, unique anatomic features of kids as it relates to their extremities, their bones are immature, they're flexible, 
and you tend to fracture at sites of cartilaginous, cartilaginous growth plates. And what this means is there may, even in some patients, have a, they may even have a fracture without a significant deformity present. Uh, and so your physical exam is really going to be important when it comes to that, looking for areas of pain. Um, mechanisms obviously play, play a role in what injuries to suspect. Um, with MVCs, um, you know, unrestrained, it can be anything. We're talking about airbag injuries. We're going to have significant um, facial and ocular injuries, particularly in those patients who are improperly placed in the front seat. Uh, if patients are restrained, you know, anything's game as well. What we tend to see is a lot of our patients, particularly in the adolescent population uh, and a little bit younger, tend to not want to wear their shoulder harness because it just doesn't feel right and so we have a lot of just isolated lap belt wearing and that ends up resulting in significant spine and abdominal trauma. Um, you guys um, see this more than I ever do because you're on the scene and you're looking to see if patients are properly restrained if they're if they have been kind of what that involves. I put this in here just to, as a reminder, people may ask, you know, the safest place for infants and children uh, younger than 13 years of age is the back seat. And then they should, you know, infants should be in a rear facing car seat as long as they can until they get out of the maximum height for that car seat. Then they should be in a forward facing car seat uh, until they outgrow that. And then they should probably be in some sort of belt positioning booster seat uh, until they're at least eight or 12 years old. And a lot of that is, is gonna be based on their uh, eventual height um, but back seat is the best place for those kids one of the questions I have for you guys is sort of what's your policy around transport of a particularly of an infant who may have been in a car seat um, in their accident sort of what do you guys do do you have a specific commercial device that you use instead or do you use the car seat <coughs> Perfect. Yeah, so that's a great thing to use for patients who are, are small and need to be secured in the back of your ambulance. Um, I just, I was reading this sort of all over the place and that's obviously something you want to figure out before you go on a run like this. Um, other mechanisms, obviously kids get hit, you know, we're starting to get warmer weather, so this is going to be more of an issue. Um, the classic Waddell's triad, um, which is probably, uh, Waddell just got lucky and found a few patients that fit this, but um, is the classic, you know, car bumper hits the leg, kid's chest hits the top of the car, and then they hit their head when they fall back. Um, so you can have some, several different areas of concern when it comes to uh, injury patterns. Uh, another big mechanism that we see generally tends not have EMS involvement. This is many times just kind of the parents bring them in. The supracondylar humerus fractures. Uh, if you have a fall, um, if you do transport those patients, certainly want to make sure you do a neurovascular check because there can be vascular compromise with that significant that specific injury. Uh, and then you know high uh, height, medium height, you can have all kinds of injuries. Um, I trained, part of my training was in Colorado, so we had a lot of snowboarding and skiing injuries, not so much here. Uh, we have bike injuries, um, scooter injuries, I'm sure you guys have seen. Um, heck, a bike going down any one of these streets with a thousand potholes is probably at risk right now. Uh, obviously, helmeted or unhelmeted is going to dictate kind of what types of injuries you should suspect. Uh, even with a helmet, you can have significant neck injuries, uh, and then if you hit a, a parked object or something like that. The anything's fair game. Kids, as I mentioned, have unique anatomic features. Their chest, particularly, is quite flexible. It's not ossified. That ossification kind of happens in late adolescence. And what that means is, and particularly because it's also not well mu muscularized, is you can have a significant amount of force transferred from whatever's hitting a kid or whatever the child has hit uh, to internal organs. Uh, additionally, their mediastinum is much more flexible, which means that your uh, small pneumothorax may actually invert, uh, exert a significant amount of physiologic effect with tension physiology. Uh, 
It's the second leading cause of death. As I mentioned, it requires a significant amount of change in velocity to create an injury. We rarely see, like in adults, you'll see aortic injuries, but it is possible. Uh, the more concern with kids is um, transfer of injury through the lungs and pulmonary contusion. So you may see oxygenation issues even early on in your pediatric trauma patient who's been injured. Um, and this all can be in the absence of significant external trauma. Uh, pneumothoraces, as you all are uh, quite aware, they can be simple, they can be open. The treatment of an open pneumothorax for a kid is very much the same as an adult, three-way uh, occlusive um, dressing to allow for the ex uh, expiration of air outside of the thor thorax. Uh, prevent in-training of additional air uh, as that three-way, this uh, picture shows right there. And then things that we'll see um, somewhat frequently is needle decompression of the chest, which in a kid is totally fine. I would do it. I'll show you the next slide where to do it. Um, one of the things to consider is if you have intubated uh, a kid uh, is to consider right, right main stem intubation. If you've gone too deep, sometimes that can also mimic uh, a pneumothorax. Do you guys do intubations routinely on kids, case by case basis? Some agencies have protocols that will say no intubation, just do. Rare. So if you do it, and you don't hear breast sounds on one side, particularly uh, on that left side, consider a right mainstem uh, intubation. Tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis to result from mediastinal shift and the loss of venous return. Um, you'll see chest, or you'll heal, hear chest hyperresonance, decreased breast sounds, tracheal deviation away from the side of your tension. Other differentials include cardiac tamponade. You can have significant gastric um, dilation in a kid, so um, if you're able and um, protocols dictate, put down an OG tube. Um, and then also consider right main stem intubation if there's a loss of breath sounds on, on particularly that left side. Uh, but needle decompression uh, should be considered. Uh, you know, second um, intercostal space, midclavicular line is the classic spot. You can also do anterior axillary line. Um, in the fourth or fifth interspace, um, and obviously you're feeling you're listening for a rush of air. Airway injuries in kids are um, not super common, but when they present, can be significant. Uh, one of the findings is subcutaneous emphysema, is that Rice Krispies underneath the skin type feeling. Um, if they're small for us, they generally heal on their own. Uh, occasionally, you'll have to put a chest tube in for this, and occasionally, you'll have to actually repair it in the operating room. A unique injury to kids because of their uh, chest wall compliance is traumatic asphyxia. And it can be a pretty impressive finding um, where you have cervical, facial, petechiae, uh, and significant uh, cyanosis above the area of compression. Uh, and uh, as pictured here, a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Uh, this kids, assuming they uh, don't have uh, suffocation, will do fine with this type of injury. As I mentioned, their organs are more exposed, they're larger relative to their body, the abdominal wall provides less protection, and, and you also have less perinephric fat. And so what that means is their uh, intra-abdominal organs are at high, high risk for injury. If you think about uh, many kids, their abdomen really begins at nipple level, okay? So uh, their rib cage doesn't provide a lot of adequate protection for everything in their abdomen. And what we end up seeing is minor forces to the abdomen result in significant solid organ injury, particularly the liver and spleen, which can result in uh, exsanguination in some cases. Uh, with abdominal trauma, you know, 12, up to 12% will have some sort of injury with blunt trauma. Um, blunt abdominal trauma is much more common than thoracic trauma, thankfully, uh, but it, and, it, and it's much less likely to be fatal. And for us as trauma surgeons, uh, almost routinely we'll manage these patients without operation. Uh, that being said, I'll show you a couple of operative pictures. I think the physical exam, particularly as you're related to abdominal trauma, can be difficult. Uh, and the age and the chaos of any scenario, and you guys deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis, can make things really difficult. I think, you know, our cell phones have made this a little bit easier, so distraction techniques. I would come up with a few YouTube videos that you want to show and uh, try to make things as, as comfortable as you can. I think the other thing is involving parents in, into these exams is probably an important thing to help calm children. 
Uh, but for abdominal trauma, things that I'm thinking about is, you know, is a patient persistently tachycardic? Do they have contusions, abrasions? Uh, is there tenderness in one or all uh, quadrants of the abdomen? And then they, do they have visible trauma, such as a seatbelt sign, which you see in the left picture there, or a, a handlebar mark, that circular mark that you see on the right picture? And both of those uh, pictures can result in pretty significant um, intra-abdominal injuries. Um, a belt mark like that can result in chance fractures, which is an upper lumbar spine fracture, pancreas injuries, duodenal injuries, and small bowel injuries, so uh, not to be um, taken lightly. And I've seen handlebar injuries like the one on the right cause um, transection of the pancreas, uh, uh, jejunal injuries, anything, anything kind of between there and the spine can be injured. How might that present for you all in the back of an ambulance? Well, it may just be left upper quadrant pain uh, if we're talking about splenic injuries, uh, tachycardia, left upper quadrant tenderness. Um, there may not be a lot to see um, from an abdominal kind of inspection standpoint, but there may be significant intra-abdominal injuries. Uh, the picture on the left there just shows a significant splenic injury. And then the picture on the right uh, is an intraoperative photo of a splenic laceration. Um, as I mentioned, about 95% of these are managed without operation. Uh, if it's a significant injury with concern for bleeding, they'll go to our PICU, uh, but they will not generally require um, operation. Uh, for liver injuries, kind of the same thing, but on the right side, you can write upper quadrant pain, re referred pain to the right shoulder, um, Kerr sign, uh, and uh, tachycardia can also be found. CT scan of significant liver injuries, um, pretty obvious here, here, and then a picture from the OR of a pretty significant devitalized portion of the liver from blunt abdominal trauma. Thankfully, as trauma surgeons, we don't get into that position very often uh, in kids. Our adult colleagues uh, will see that a little bit more frequently. I have a question. Ask away. Me, sorry. <laughs> Why is it with those kind of injuries or like, even I've heard with, uh, so like why do they have shoulder pain with those type of abdominal Yeah, it's all referred pain from diaph the diaphragm. So you know, three, four, five, keep the diaphragm alive, uh, cervical nerves, that referred pain gets referred up to the shoulder. So left upper quadrant, diaphragmatic irritation, left shoulder irritation, same, and then the right side goes to the right shoulder. So it's all related to the diaphragm. Other questions? All right. That's why when patients who've had um, who've had splenic injuries come back, particularly splenic injuries, come back to the hospital for something and they've got shoulder pain, they'll usually get an abdominal CT scan. Hiccups is another thing that they can present with um, later on, just from irritation of the diaphragm. Um, other intra-abdominal injuries, as I mentioned. Um, you know, intestinal injuries is probably the next most common intra-abdominal thing that we'll find as a put after solid organ injuries uh, of the liver, spleen, and kidneys. Um, we see that usually on CT scan, although it can present with um, peritonitis. Sometimes it can be difficult to uh, figure out, and I think that's if you're talking with families, particularly if they've got abdominal exam findings and whether or not they want to be transported or not, I would always have them checked out because some of these injuries can be occult and show up hours to half a day later. Uh, GU trauma, pretty uncommon with kids. We can occasionally see it with pelvic injuries, but pelvic fractures are not as common in kids as they are in adults. And then pancreas and duodenal injuries on a physical exam front present fairly similar to the intestinal injuries. Any questions about that? I'm going fast essentially so we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about at the end, so. All right, perfect. Uh, physical child abuse is a sad reality of the job that we do is seeing these cases. Um, I think it's an incredibly important part, as I mentioned when I first started, of your role as frontline providers to evaluate not only the patient in front of you, the circumstances around them, who's there, the story that's told to you, um, what other things can you glean from, from your quick visit into that house, into wherever you're picking up that patient that may help understand what happened f uh, to this kid. There are formal definitions. Um, essentially, uh, neg child neglect is sort of the overarching uh, uh, term, and that's where you, there's any act or failure to act, 
uh, that results in death, uh, physical, emotional harm, sexual abuse, exploitation, or an act or failure to act, which presents imminent risk of physical harm. So this is not only physical abuse, but also things like um, not feeding your kid, not taking care of your kid. And then when we talk about specific um, f child physical abuse, it's intentional physical force, hitting, kicking, shaking, burning, or other shore force against a kid. And that's just the legal definition. When we talk about the stats, it's incredibly sad. So um, this is a report from 2017, and the 2019 report looks very similar. So 3.5 million reports created of potential abuse in this country, and just under 20% are substantiated, which results in you know 600 and almost 700,000 cases of substantiated physical child abuse in this country on an annual basis. Um, and of child abuse. 75% of that is neglect, almost 20% of that is physical child abuse. And as you guys have probably seen in your practice, 80% of that is the people in the home, generally the caregivers. If you look at abuse by age, it's as you would anticipate. Um, and so, or, and this is maltreatment in addition to physical abuse, but it's our youngest patients are have the highest risk. There's really no gender um, predilection. Um, about half of these incur, occur in white patients, about 25 in Hispanic, 25% Hispanic and 21% in African Americans. Um, and so really it's a, it, if, if you will, a disease of kind of all, um, all comers and it doesn't know a socioeconomic um, preference. It really happens in our uh, wealthiest of, of families and our uh, poorest. If you look at deaths annually, and this is from 2017, uh, that red box, it results in uh, somewhere around uh, 1,700 fatalities annually. And if you think about um, that, and 40% of these are, are physical abuse, if you think about that, if you look at the American Cancer Society, there's about 1,100 kids uh, under 15 that die from cancer. So uh, to put it in perspective, it's a significant problem, obviously not having any telethons or marathons about um, this issue, but it's probably more important. As a reminder, you all um, are mandatory reporters by uh, virtue of the position you hold, um, and there are ways to report that. Um, you can go to this website and figure that out. Um, it's pretty easy to do in the state. I will say if you transport someone to Riley Hospital uh, and have those concerns, a discussion with our social worker will result in a, a 310, which is the paperwork that's filed to uh, start that type of investigation. How do you know, you know what, what risk factors are there and what can you look for for patients um, that may be suggestive of, of physical child abuse? Well, these, as I mentioned, these patients tend to be younger, under four years of age. That doesn't mean everyone, particularly on the neglect front, but particularly physical child abuse. You know, burns, any burns, particularly patterned burns, uh, a fracture in a non-ambulatory patient. So this is where all of those kind of developmental milestone charts are helpful to understand when kids can do what. Uh, but if you have a three-month-old who uh, they tell you has fallen off the couch. Um, that's a pretty, uh, pretty big stretch, in my opinion, for any sort of significant injury. Uh, metaphyseal fractures. So when you get our X-rays, do they have a fracture on the corner of their, um, particularly tibia or uh, tibia? Uh, torn frenulum, I'll show you the labial frenula here in a second. Any bruising in a non-ambulatory child, or if the child is ambulatory, bruising to strange places, particularly the head uh, behind the ears and the neck. Um, if we see elevation in lab work, um, patterned bruises, and then if we see skull fractures is another important thing. Uh, as it relates to the history, if they have delays in presentation, if there's a changing story, that's why it's really important to understand kind of the story as you hear it up front because many times uh, these perpetrators are not very good at lying and lying consistently. Uh, and so understanding what they tell you as a story and documenting that well is an important aspect of the workup. If it's unwitnessed, if you see domestic violence or suggestion of domestic violence, that's another thing to consider as a risk factor for abuse. Kids with chronic medical conditions, particularly prematurity, uh, history of prematurity can be a significant risk factor. And if people are acting weird, you're concerned, the onus is on you to report that. Uh, the labial frenulum, uh, frenula, I guess. So there's um, two of them. 
up, up here, down here, it, and then underneath the tongue, the lingual, lingual um, frenulum. Uh, usually the, ling the labial frenula are the ones that we consider being pathognomonic, a, a laceration of that as being kind of almost pathognomonic of abuse. It's from something getting shoved in someone's mouth, getting hit directly in the mouth. So um, a good physical exam should include looking in the mouth. We screen for um, physical child abuse and maltreatment on all pediatric patients that come to Riley Hospital. And this is a lot of words, but it's essentially five points that we look at for all patients of the appropriate age. So under, particularly under two, but also um, uh, many of the patients under four years of age. Um, and here are the questions that we ask, you know, was there um, a delay in seeking medical attention? Does the history match the injury? Um, and are any of these things found? So if a kid's less than six months, is there a bruise, subconjunctival hemorrhage, so that eye finding or frenulum injury, which as I mentioned, are almost pathognomonic in that age group of concern for physical abuse. And if the kid's older than six months, do they have patterned injuries, marks, burns, um, bruises that you wouldn't expect for that um, child's age? Thinking again about um, neck, ear, behind the ear, uh, buttocks, um, and then you know, are there more bruises than you would expect? Um, this is the fourth question is a neglect, you know, is there poor supervision, care, nourishment, or hygiene? And then do you have any other concerns? Now this is not something where if you get one question or two questions, you absolutely have been abused, but it really focuses our emergency department providers to think about this and then do a for either additional workup or to do additional history um, with a patient's caregiver to figure out kind of what happened. Any questions about physical child abuse? All right. And then finally, I just want to talk about the pre-hospital care. You guys know all of this stuff, so um, this is 100% probably too simplistic and basic, but I wanted to at least just put it out there because, I, again, I think the basics are what going to, are, are what going, these things are going to um, get you out of a bind. And for me, I'm always going back to the ABCs when it comes to any trauma uh, resuscitation. That's certainly what I teach my residents and how we approach them in the trauma bay. Every pediatric trauma talk is required to have the first point, so children are not little adults. Uh, but really the big thing for them is airway management and oxygenation. If you look at outside of hemorrhage um, for kids or for instance the high cervical spine where they're not able to breathe, the thing that's going to dictate uh, a cardiorespiratory arrest is their ability to oxygenate. So if you can oxygenate a patient, you're going to be able to get them to their next step. Um, and I, like I said before, sticking to the basics is really, I think, the most important thing if you have kids if you have grandkids if you have nieces and nephews and they're the first thing that comes to your mind which they inevitably will that's also going to take the emotions up a notch and that's when it can be much more difficult to really just provide that um, standard ABC care that's going to get you uh, a patient that's uh, alive and doing well when they get to the emergency department so ABCs, and again, for the airway, inability to establish and maintain a patent airway is really why these kids arrest um, outside of a hemorrhaging patient. So you wanna make sure you're listening for breath sounds, you, have to, you wanna make sure that you've got circulation, and cap refill may be the only thing that you can look at as a, way to, as a um, marker of your perfusion, and that's totally fine. So kids, um, the airway is terrifying. I th personally think it's terrifying. Um, you know, they've got all the lymphoid tissue, they've got a floppy tongue, big tongue, uh, their subglottis is narrow and it can become easily obstructed. And so these can be very challenging airways. Um, if you don't feel comfortable doing an endotracheal tube, there are oropharyngeal options for many of our kids. And if you've got those on your rig, I would highly recommend doing that. Again, ox being able to oxygenate is the most important thing. And then obviously we want to immobilize our C-spine. What do you all do for the patients who are small, one month old in a car accident? Um, do you guys have cervical collars that go down that low? Yeah, I think that's perfect. Just something to immobilize that, that head. Um, it can be really tough to keep something on a rig that's that small and you use so infrequently. So I think towel rolls are perfect. IV bags also work.
Um, the Braslow tape, as you guys know, is a lifesaver, particularly when it comes to understanding the size of endotracheal tube you need and, and also understanding this, the d dose of medications that you need to use. Um, when you're looking at the millimeter size of your tube, if you think about kind of age divided by four, um, plus four equals the millimeters of the size of your tube. Some people use that calculation. I wouldn't be able to remember that, so I would just use the colors of the, of the tape. Um, if you do intubate a patient, uh, even with an oropharyngeal airway, uh, considering um, using capnography not only to confirm placement, but then to follow uh, the PCO2 over time, that would be helpful. Obviously, you want to auscultate. And then think about right main stem intubations. It's pretty common, particularly when you've got a little baby baby and you just put that tube in and everyone's high-fiving it's really easy to just push it down a little bit further and the dis distance between uh, normal kind of tracheal uh, intubation versus the right st main, main stem is maybe a couple centimeters at most um, so for breathing you're gonna look listen and feel as you always do for kids particularly with CNS injuries they may lose their drive um, to breathe they may have um, cervical spine injuries that prevents their diaphragm from working if they've got significant pulmonary contusions you may see that VQ mismatch that doesn't allow for oxygenation uh, or uh, there's such amount of blood and hemorrhage in the airway that you may not be able to actually hear breast sounds on that side um, and then pneumothoraces as we talked about earlier um, the picture on the right is a picture of a tension pneumothorax in the patient's right lung. And what you see is flattening of the diaphragm. You see the lung, I think everyone can see that lung outline here. Um, that's starting to get to tension uh, uh, physiology. Uh, obviously an x-ray is not how you want to diagnose that. So that patient should be decompressed with a chest tube or if you're in the field, should have a needle decompression. Um, and the right side here is really just to show some rib fractures. Rib fractures in a kid are pretty uncommon, as we mentioned before. This is a study that our neurosurgeons did, and it looked at how, what can be done in a pre-hospital setting to affect outcome in patients with traumatic brain injury. And so they looked at all the patients admitted to the ICU uh, over, I forget how many years, seven years or something like that, and they asked, um, what's different between the, those who lived and died. One of the things, particularly as it related to pre-hospital care, was those patients who came in hypothermic and hypoxic had higher mortality. And those are easy things um, in most cases for you guys to affect change on. Warm up the back of your rig, keep the kid's head covered if you can, and then oxygen administration. The other thing that they found was uh, hyper or hypocapnia also uh, contributed to mortality. Welcome back. Was it a, was it a baby? No. Oh. <laughs> no, sir. So wanted it to be a baby. <laughs> we were hoping. No idea. It's not funny, but <laughs> <laughs> That's good, because we covered that on the slides earlier, so you would have missed out. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so uh, you want to, uh, eucapnia is the other thing, so you don't want to overventilate or underventilate these patients. I know that there's some thinking, particularly in traumatic brain injuries, about uh, hyperventilating a patient, get their PCO2 down um, to prevent brain herniation. I think that stuff has kind of gone out the, out the window, and just maintaining a PCO2 between 35 and 45 is really all you need to do um, for patients uh, as you're transporting them. Uh, circulation, we obviously want to make sure that we can assess end or organ perfusion. Level of consciousness is one common thing. Capillary refill is another. Uh, heart rate, blood pressure monitoring. And why does this matter? Well, we know that kids have significant physiologic reserve. This is another very common graph um, that you'll see. So as blood loss increases in kids, particularly even up to 25%, the only thing that you might see is a slight change in heart rate. You certainly will not see a change in blood pressure because there's significant compensation. Once you get over 25% blood loss, um, you start to see tachycardia. And then once you start, once you see um, hypotension, you've fallen off that compensatory curve and you may lose, to, lose ground that you cannot recover. So in a kid, 80 to 90 mLs per kilo is the usual blood volume. Uh, we think of greater than 25% causing shock, as I mentioned, so that may be up to, you know, maybe 20 mLs per kilogram. And if you think about a baby, that's not a lot. A four kilogram baby, 
not much blood at all. And what do we see at that high level of blood loss? Well, we see these compensatory mechanisms fail. Um, good luck. Um, so you may have tachycardia, but that may, that may move to bradycardia. Once you get bradycardia, you can, you can just plan on the, on the loss of your blood pressure and a, and a cardiac arrest um, because those patients will not recover and they need to be treated with volume and rapid transport. From a venous access standpoint, certainly try a large bore IV uh, if you can, uh, but if, particularly if a patient's unstable, moving to intraosseous access quickly is important. Um, I don't think of any specific age cutoff. I think as you get under six months of age for intraosseous access, it starts to get a little bit more difficult, um, but it's not impossible. The contraindications are the same as adults. So if they've got a fracture on the same extremity, if they've had a previous placement attempt, if they've got infection, if they've got osteogenesis imperfecta, if that's something that you know at the time, I would hold off. Other than that, it's free reign. Um, proximal tibia is probably the most common site. Distal humor or distal tibia is the next most common site and then distal femur. Um, and most babies will do fine with the, um, what is that, pink 15 millimeter needle. Um, this is the easy IO. I don't know if you guys use that power drill IO. Um, but in a little bit chubbier kids, you, uh, in, in, the, in a Hoosier infant, you may need uh, one of those blue ones. Uh, and then as you get older, you can do other things like proximal humerus or iliac crest. That's a little, that's getting down there on the, on the number of sites, but that may be indicated based on the injuries. Um, if you're providing IV fluid resuscitation, I would consider initial 20 per kilo bolus of LR versus normal saline. There are uh, trauma surgeons who've written their, who've made careers out of uh, trying to decide which one is better. I don't think there's any data to suggest one is better than the other. Um, repeating a bolus is fine. Uh, we think of um, patients moving quickly to blood transfusion if they've not responded to IV fluid resuscitation. And for us, um, when you're bringing a patient to Riley, I would just know how much you've given so that we can figure out if you've given 40 per kilo of fluids already, we're going to move immediately to blood in a patient who's still hemodynamically unstable. And there is a changing paradigm about IV fluid resuscitation. So um, we're, what we're all trying to do, you guys start the resuscitation, we continue it in the hospital, is really to prevent um, the lethal triad of trauma acidosis, hypothermia, and trauma-induced coagulopathy. And this involves, obviously, direct pressure, hemorrhage control. Uh, the other thing I always mention is tourniquets are fine in kids, just like you would use them in an adult. Um, and part of the principles of this damage control resuscitation where, where we are preventing this lethal triad is judicious crystalloid use. Uh, we obviously at the hospital are going to use early warmed blood products and hemostatic agents. Uh, but the judicious crystalloid use can be impacted by you all if you're starting a resuscitation. And what happens when you give too much crystalloid, LR, normal saline, whatever, pick your poison, is you get a dilutional coagulopathy, so all of those factors get diluted out. If you have a quote unquote soft clot that's plugging a hole somewhere, if you give a bunch of fluid, increase the pressure significantly, you may lose that blood clot and restart hemorrhage. Um, there's some immune effects of, of crystalloids and uh, actually pro-inflammatory uh, effects from uh, normal saline. In addition to the metabolic acidosis, acute kidney injury, acute kid kidney injury uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and even compartment syndrome that can happen if you give too much IV fluid. Um, how do we know if we've given enough? Um, well, you may see slowing of the heart rate. You may, um, I don't use pulse pressure that often, but you may see an increased pulse, pr pulse pressure. Skin color may return, your extremities may warm, uh, sensorium improve, blood pressure increase, um, and then if, you've, if you're transported a patient who happens to have an indwelling catheter, you may see good urine output. This is a great study from um, the New England Journal of Medicine from the early 90s. And, this is, the study was sort of getting at when should you give IV fluids, and so I don't know if you, if you all have seen this study, but um, what they did, this was out of Houston, and I don't re even know how they got this passed by any sort of regulatory body, but they did, and they asked their EMS crews to do one of two things. Uh, in all patients, place an IV, but if this patient had blunt uh, torso trauma with hypotension, half of those patients would get initial resuscitation per their protocols in EMS, and the other half they would just 
put the IV in and that was it. And the patients in whom they just put the IV in and gave no crystalloid had a slightly uh, improved survival. It was like 70% versus 62%. But, um, and particularly in the 90s, there was a lot of crystalloid being administered. But the whole idea there was that if you flood these folks with crystalloid, you're gonna see a worse outcome less probably of an issue in pediatric trauma, but it was an interesting idea, and it's something that we're actually probably getting back to here in, in the field of trauma surgery uh, over time. Um, this is just the ATLS, so this is like the Bible that we use. Um, do you guys take ATLS? So, sometimes in hospital paramedics will, but uh, if not, what's the, there's a EMS. ATLS. Yes. Um, this is the Bible for hospital-based providers, and really what it's, I only put this in here because the newest edition has, has asked us as providers to decrease the amount of crystalloid before we move to blood. Now, obviously, you're in the back of an ambulance, you don't have a blood bank there with you. If you have to give resuscitation to improve someone's pressure to prevent a cardiac arrest, uh, that's what you have to do, and I'm certainly not preaching against that. But, but just be mindful that the use of crystalloid without a specific target um, in your resuscitation may be detrimental. What's the, what's the data in kids? If you get above 60 per kilo, you potentially may out impact outcomes, but it's hard to know. Uh, as I mentioned, this is a bridge to getting patients to hemorrhage control uh, if you can't do that externally. Uh, so if we have to pack an abdomen off or something like that, and the use of blood products. Uh, and that's why I said it's important to know kind of how much you've given before you come to the hospital. And then finally, so A, B, C, D, disability. The only thing that I'll say there is um, understanding that your kid's under a year, you're gonna have to use sort of different cues to understand um, uh, particularly their verbal and motor response. And I can get you the guys these slides. Um, that's, that's kind of what I have. One of the things we're doing at Riley, and we're trying to do this well, and if we don't do it well, I'm gonna include my email and cell phone, and you can tell me so that I can, um, uh, I, I'm being recorded so I so that I can ask people to do better next time but it's this 60 second salute and really what this is is to allow you all to give your report um, I think sometimes we get super busy like starting everything and we miss that opportunity to like hear everything that you're telling us so uh, our goal is to do this better um, I will say we're not perfect but we're getting there and like I said if you if it doesn't go well, I'm asking you to help me out. So this is what we went over. Um, this is a picture from, uh, you know, why do we do what we do? It's stuff like this. This is um, from the Graham, and it's um, Brielle McNeil. She's one of our patients, had a gunshot wound uh, up in kind of Pike Township, and they brought her in, and this was the reunion. I mean, this is, this is why we do what we do. It doesn't matter if it's kid or adult, but it certainly hits home for us when, um, we see a kid come in sick and then have the opportunity to get to this point. Uh, obviously not all kids uh, do well. I mentioned we've got mortalities from all kinds of things and uh, one of the things we're trying to do better and Nicole Hall there in the back of the room, if you, I don't, do you all know her? She's our EMS liaison, uh, is to really reach out to crews that, are, that have, may have difficult um, runs. I mean, I would encourage you, uh, all runs in which there's a death or you know, something bad happened can be difficult, but particularly when it comes to kids, it can be quite significant. So stay healthy is my, is my last uh, point there. Uh, that's all I have. Sorry for rambling for a long period of time. Email, cell phone. If there's a problem, I'm happy to address it. If you guys have a tough run, if you want to talk about a specific case, I'll come anytime.